and welcome to the Estranti pre clean analysis for the February 2018 operational case study exam. And the case company we've been given in this case is called King Crystal and they're a manufacturer of crystal glassware. Now before we get into the pre scene itself, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and our strategy and approach with regard to this pre scene analysis set of videos. So my name is James and I am a co-director here at Estranti. Been with Estranti for several years now and at one time or another I've been involved with pretty much every single aspect of production within the business including the case study exam so you're in safe hands with me. Uh, just to go through a few more things, I'm a mock writer so the case studies when they started for SEMA back in 2015, we've been doing uh, specialized case study products ever since. One of those are mock exams, and I've written several of the mocks that we've released over the years. And I'm also consider myself something of a case study expert. Um, like I say, the case study exam started back in 2015, and ever since then, I've been involved in one way or another with pretty much every pre scene and case study. That's an operational management or strategic level, been involved in pretty much everyone in one way or another since its inception. So I know a lot about how the case study works, how the pre-scene works, and how the pre-scene sets itself up for the exam uh, later on. In addition to that, I've also actually written a real case study exam for SEMA uh, back in 2015. We wrote a SEMA Asia exam that was actually used for in, in a real exam over in the SEMA Asia um, region. And so I not only have I been looking and experienced with case studies for a few years, but I've actually written one as well. So I've written, wrote the pre-scene and I know what it's involved and how the pre-scene is a really good guide to the kind of things that's gonna come up in the exam. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, I'm one of the main study text authors here at Histranti and I've been involved again with pretty much every study text that has come out and that includes all levels and all pillars. So um, my actual area of expertise are the finance, is the finance pillar, so the F1 and F2 study text, but I've worked on the enterprise pillar and the P pillar as well. So there's not really much that I haven't looked at in my time here. I've got a good general all round knowledge, which is perfect for the case study exams. So what can you expect from this video series. What are we going to do? Why is it worth anything to you? Why is it worth your time? So the first thing we're going to do is we're really going to take the pre-scene that's been given and we're just going to go through it with a fine tooth comb looking at every little detail as we go through because as I said getting to, getting to know the pre-scene and having a good understanding of the pre-scene is really the best way to be prepared for the exam. So what particularly we're going to focus on are some of the key points. So as we go through I'll be making key points areas that as I read through I think well that's that's definitely going to be an important thing and that's almost certainly going to be relevant at some stage in the exam. We're going to be having some industry guidance and how it relates so I've spent the past few weeks going through everything that I could find on the particular industry that we're involved in on this occasion and I'm going to be bringing that to the pre-scene and making it relevant and applying it to the scenario so we have a real world feel for how this all fits together and what kind of things the company are going to be dealing with. We're going to be looking at all the key business models so of course we're going to be thinking about pestle, fortified forces, all the kind of business models that we can use to assess and analyze the company, the areas of strength, the weaknesses and how they may go forward in the future, what kind of things you could say in your exam because often your role is to advise or to give some kind of information and the best way, one of the best ways to do that are using the classic business models. We're going to be picking up likely exam issues. So those first three points there, they all kind of feed down into what are likely things to come up in the exam. And like I said, I was I wrote one of the pre-scenes for an exam a few years ago. And so the best, the best thing to do really when you're approaching the pre-scene is to kind of read between the lines and think, well, SEMA have written this pre-scene, they've made up this company, and this it is a real life industry, but it's a made up company. And you've got to think, well, 
what areas are they setting themselves up for so they can think of exam uh, scenarios when it actually comes to the exam. So you, if you look at it in that way, think, well, why have they written it like this? Probably because they've got an exam question that they want to ask about that particular area. So as we go through, I'll be picking out areas of the pre-scene that I think are very likely to be coming up in the exam. And as well as that, I'll be giving some exam hints and tips. So at Strand T, we've got a couple of study texts and textbooks on specifically how to pass your case study exams. And I was, I was heavily involved in the writing of those, so I know plenty about the exams and the extra little tidbits and tips and things that can help you to get through the exam uh, beyond just uh, pure knowledge and application. In addition to the pre-scene videos, so there's going to be a number of pre-scene videos just looking at the pre-scene, we're going to have a strategic analysis and that won't necessarily evolve looking at the pre-scene in too much more depth. We'll already have covered that. This is kind of a big picture, broader look at the company, where they stand and what they can do going forward. And we'll have a specific video dedicated to the top 10 issues. So I'm going to give you 10 things that I think are very likely to come up in the exam in February based on the things that we'll see in the pre-scene. And there's usually a pretty good track record here at Estranti. We're quite proud of the fact that our top 10 issues, more often than not, most of them are things that actually come up in the exam. So that's what you can expect. And here's how it will work. So in the section by section pre-scene videos, I'm going to assume that you haven't seen the pre-scene yet. And you can assume that I haven't really seen it either because I've, I've been through it a little bit, I've made some notes, but a lot of it will be doing as we go through. So you can assume that I'm, I'm not going to take any knowledge for granted here. And so what you can do is before you watch my video and see what I say about it, have a go at reading through it yourself, make some notes and see how much you can come up with on your own. See, see how well you do there. And when you've made your own notes, come back to the video and have a look at what I've said and then maybe see if there's anything that you've missed out or not covered in enough depth or perhaps there might even be things that you think are good points that I haven't covered myself. And you're welcome to leave a comment and perhaps add anything that you think we've missed out. That's perfectly, you're perfectly welcome to do that. And at the end, we'll go through the strategic analysis video and the top 10 issues video. So in total, you're looking at, depending on the length of the pre-scene, sort of eight or nine videos uh, in total. So just a few quick notes on the actual pre-scene and your approach to the pre-scene actually that I want to make before we, we start looking at the thing itself. Context is key here, so the whole idea of the pre-scene is to set up this realistic scenario, this realistic world in which this business operates. And so it's important to always think about the context um, when we're looking at the issues. Don't write a thing based on the pre-scene before the exam. So do go through the pre-scene in a lot of depth and get as much out of it as you can, but don't assume that you can sort of write your question, your answers to questions before you go into the, the actual exam, because as you know, we don't know what's going to be in the exam and you might waste your time focusing on this one particular issue and that's one of the issues that doesn't come up in the exam. So don't, don't try to write anything based on the pre-scene, uh, just use it as a way to learn as much as you can about the business so you can be well prepared in the exam. And the real the real function of the pre-scene, as we said, is it's the background. It's you you're really if you imagine that you are in a real business, for a moment, just suspend this belief and imagine that you have the actual job of finance officer or whatever it is at this business, and that you're going to be asked to advise or analyze or evaluate certain areas of the business to your boss. So the best way that you would ever be able to do that is to know as much as possible as you can about the business you're working in and the industry they're working in. So that's all this is. The pre-scene is kind of this report that gives you the key information, as much of it as possible, so you can give good answers in the exam. So that's the best approach that uh, I can advise that you take uh, when watching these videos and getting ready for the exam. So back to the pre-scene then, let's get started. So to begin with, I'd like to just quickly run through the plan with regards to what video will feature which part of the pre-scene. So in this first video, the one that you're in right now, we're going to be looking at sections one, two, and three. 
In video two, we'll be moving on to the Glassblower's handbook as provided in the pre-scene and we'll be mainly focusing on the manufacturing process. That'll be in video two. And then in video three, we'll move on to sections B and C and we'll be looking at the organizational chart for the company and we'll be looking at the directors and their roles within the company and having a very, very much a focus on the way that the company is structured and managed. Video four, we'll be moving on to section five here where we look at other information about the business. There's a few pages of information, uh, interesting information there. Uh, and there we also have some information about the market and the industry as a whole. In video five, we're moving on to the financial statements uh, for the first half. And then in the second half, we'll be looking at the budgeted information given. Also in video five, we'll be taking a quick look at the tax regime of Gigland. Uh, that will just be a short, quick run through the very final page of the pre-scene. And in the final video, in video six, we'll be looking at the news article and the other two articles given in the pre-scene about the glassmaking industry uh, that are relevant to the business. That will be uh, the final video uh, in video six. Okay, so video one, what we'll do now is get cracking and start by looking at the introduction. Okay, so to start with, we'll just take this one sentence at a time and I'll start highlighting any useful, important information and making notes on that information. As we go on through the pre-scene, often information is repeated and we may be able to take it uh, one paragraph at a time. But for the moment, we're being introduced to the company, we're finding out about it for the first time. You want to be very careful about making notes here to make sure we understand and get a good idea of, of what the company is, how it's run and what kind of position it is in going into the exam. Okay, so King Crystal, the company in the pre-scene, is a company based in the Northern Hemisphere in the country of Gigland, obviously a made-up company, uh, made-up country, where the currency is the G dollar. Now, this probably means that the country is roughly based on a European country, uh, something like the UK. Generally, in the operational case study, the country um, is not super important, but generally speaking, it's a country that's very similar to the UK in terms of their current sort of uh, business climate and the standards. It's very westernized. Um, and that, that's just generally something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, it certainly wouldn't be uh, an Asian country or a South American country. Best to just think of it as uh, sort of basically like the UK. King Crystal is a manufacturer of high quality hand blown crystal. Okay, so what we have here is a manufacturer only. They're not concerned uh, with retailing their own products in a commercial way. They are a manufacturer. And so that's going to be important in establishing the kind of uh, the, the culture there. It's going to be we're focusing on how the product is produced. Okay, so that certainly gives us some areas of P1 to be thinking about, particularly costing and budgeting. These are very relevant to all companies, but particularly with a manufacturer, uh, one, one of the key areas that they're going to focus on in order to look at improving their business is uh, are the areas in P1 uh, mentioned here. Okay, so we also learned that they're a high quality producer, so this places them uh, within the, the market. Uh, at the top end, they're producing high quality products, and that's going to inform the whole the production process, their pricing uh, strategy, and their sales strategy, all going to be influenced by the fact that they are a high quality manufacturer. And we also learned that what they're making is hand-blown crystal. So that's a, a, an old-fashioned, original, traditional way of making crystal uh, for glassware. And so straight away in the first two sentences, we've learned quite a lot about the company. What we learned from this is that they're probably not uh, using much in the way of machines to produce on a mass scale. They're probably making a, quite a small quantity of uh, products with a team of specialized uh, crystal, uh, hand, um, glass blowers and that again is going to be very uh, vital in sort of determining how the company can move forwards and moving on to the next bit crystal is the highest quality of glassware that can be produced okay so just from those first three sentences then we've learned quite a bit 
already. So high quality is going to be key for this company and it puts them, this places them within the market as a whole. They're a high quality manufacturer of something that is already a high quality sort of premium uh, material, crystal. It's the highest quality glassware. So, and the company is also employing skilled labor, uh, skilled glass blowers to make hand blown crystal. So all of this is is putting them in kind of a, not, not a niche necessarily, but they're certainly restricting them uh, to their place in the market. Uh, the skilled labor force is going to be costly. They're going to be hiring uh, very highly skilled um, people who have been working in this uh, business for many, many years. And that's going to be an expensive thing. But in order to get that high quality hand blown crystal, that's a necessity. So uh, you, you can sort of start to see a picture forming of the kind of restraints uh, that this company has with regards to what they can do, um, what they can do going forwards. So King Crystal makes four different types of products. They make drinking glasses, jugs, they make bowls and vases. So uh, that's just four. That's not a great uh, wide variety of different products, but they come in a number of sizes and ranges. So when you start thinking of, well, you've got four different uh, uh, products here and they each come in different sizes and possibly different ranges then that can actually multiply quite quickly and become a very large number of different things that need to be made and again this is probably since the fact that it's a high quality uh, hand blown product that's going to require uh, sort of you know a, a lot of different products uh, being made by probably relatively few uh, people So if we continue, we do actually find that all products are handcrafted by highly skilled glass blowers. So if we have um, a company here, every single uh, product that they made needs to be made by hand where, you know, you can imagine in this world, the great competition is going to be uh, companies who are producing glassware on the production line and outputting perhaps thousands or hundreds of thousands of units per day obviously the quality is going to be a major difference between those two but um, in terms of the output the company does seem to be quite limited by sticking to their high quality hand-blown uh, sort of traditional artisan method of crystal making and final sentence in the first paragraph some of the products that are made today are the same design as when the business started okay so we've definitely got a company here who are very very much rooted in their where they came from and their past and they like to do things the way that they've always been done and this is the way that you maintain the quality and they they hire the best uh, glass blowers and they they make sure that the all the quality control is in place to make sure that their product is the best and this is going to be how they're going to compete so going into this it's no good sort of thinking uh well one way we could one way we could try and fix uh, the company if it's an issue is to try and you know reduce the cost involved in production but if that's a key part of the company uh, then that's not an area that it's going to be good to suggest making changes in so these are all things to keep in mind with regards to the overall strategy it's no good suggesting something when uh, a key part of the company's sort of identity is the quality of their products then make sure that any sort of suggestions at the even at the operational level are feeding in to that overall strategy uh, where you are you are considering the fact that the company their main selling point is the fact that they make high quality so reducing the quality is just not going to be something that uh, is ever ever worth mentioning really at this company okay so moving on king crystal was established in 1968 by joseph king which means they've been around for around about 50 years okay and that puts them at a very similar timeline to a real life existing crystal uh, manufacturing company called dartington okay so dartington are a, a glass blower uh, crystal manufacturer glass blowing crystal manufacturer from the United Kingdom, uh, actually in the southwest in Devon in the United Kingdom. They're established around about the same time in the late 60s and they they probably were the model for this company when SEMA were producing this pre-scene 
uh, they, they tend to model uh, pre-seeding companies on existing companies or perhaps an amalgamation of a few existing real life companies and it seems that Dartington was probably used uh, as, as a basis here so what you can do is uh, have a look at Dartington uh, look them up on the internet do a bit of research and what we'll have as well in our industry pack is we'll, we'll have included a section on, on Dartington and their history and how that applies to this particular case. But uh, I won't be saying too much about Dartington uh, in these videos apart from here. So Joseph, um, Joseph King, the guy that established the company, learned his glass bowing skills as an apprentice with the largest crystal manufacturer in the neighboring country of Beeland. Okay, so Beeland is a nearby country to Gigland, and this is where the guy who established King Crystal learnt how to become a crystal manufacturer. Okay, so Joseph had a four year apprenticeship. Okay, so that's four years uh, learning the trade and then a further six years of experience, and that was enough for him to qualify as a master glass blower. Okay, so that's a total of 10 years to go from you know complete novice to a master glass blower okay so that's a very long time uh, to be training at something and that's a significant commitment for a single person so people have to be really sure that they want to be a glass blower to go all the way and obviously this company King Crystal are going to be dependent on highly skilled master glass blowers so that's going to be that's going to be uh, an area of to watch out for going through this is to look at the the labor force uh, what kind of uh, what it takes to actually become a master glass blower and sort of the the ex the salaries of these kind of that level of skill and sort of how common it is in the world whether it's an industry that's dying out whether it's becoming harder and harder to find glass blowers or whether there are a lot of them the 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 reality there is going to impact the sort of the power uh, that King Crystal have with regards to their employment. Okay, so after qualifying, Joseph returned to Gigland and purchased a disused textile factory on the edge of a large town called Templeton. So the disused textile factory, that is the base of operations, and that's obviously going to appear in our, in our balance sheet under the PPE. Okay, our fixed assets. In addition to that, he installed a furnace and started the business. So with regards to that, then we've got the disused textile factory and the furnace, two of the major parts of the PPE. Um, obviously, a furnace is going to re require a large amount of energy to keep it going. The job of a furnace is to heat materials to very, very high temperatures so you can uh, manipulate them so that requires a lot of energy and so something uh, we should be thinking about or something we can uh, question are the energy consumption of this company obviously we should expect it to be quite high and of course developing on from that not only the consumption will be high the cost will be high but where is that energy coming from they may be a, a user of sort of if they're using energy that comes from fossil fuels and that's going to leave uh, pollution and a large carbon footprint are they using renewable energies are they being environmentally friendly all of these things sort of crop up around the practices of this business so king crystal is still based on the same single site that was the the disused textile factory although additional land was purchased in 1980 for the construction of a warehouse and offices so there we have even more uh, property plant and equipment and this is these are the things that are going to make up PPE in the balance sheet when we finally come to that okay so 1980 is uh, quite a long time ago now and we could ask the question whether any additional purchases have been made since whether any expansion has been done since 1980 or whether that was enough uh, to maintain operations for the last almost 40 years Okay, so initially the business was very small, as you might expect, with all products being fully crafted by hand. So this just further sort of cements this co the company as a sort of artisan, traditional producer of um, crystal glassware and sort of willing to stick to their guns in the old fashioned way and produce the best quality product. So the business started up in 68 
and it started off small and they grew steadily it says the business grew steadily um, for a period of years and then in 1980 Joseph won a contract to supply a large department store in Gigland and as a result of the contract additional furnaces and equipment were installed so let's unpack this a little bit so business was growing steadily but in 1980 it seems like an important turning point for the company a large contract was won and that meant the company had to supply a large department store which meant they had to significantly up their production output which meant they bought additional furnitures and um, equipment so what we can take from that perhaps is that one uh, the company was um, not necessarily lucky to win this contract but obviously uh, it was an opportunity that arised um, perhaps by good fortune not necessarily something the company was pushing towards and the second thing is that this is a fairly conservative approach uh, to not invest in expanding the company's operations until the business is definitely there. So that's not necessarily a criticism that they are conservative and in this case it was probably the right thing to do because the company is a small company, they're creating these sort of expensive high quality artisan products and so to go ahead and produce lots of these or invest in larger amounts of production without establishing your market and your your customers first that could have ended quite badly so this was a safe approach for the company and it, it worked out well for them okay so moving on to the next paragraph then we find out a bit about what's happened more recently so in 2000 uh, 18 years ago Joseph decided to retire and as he had no children to leave the business to he sold it uh, to a group of four of his managers in a management buyout each manager purchased 25 percent of the King Crystal equity. Okay, so this is a significant event in the history of the company. You have the founder, creator, and one of the most uh, important people in the company for its entire history. In 2000, uh, they decide not only to step down from their position, um, but to completely to sell the company off to their managers. So they're completely no longer involved uh, whatsoever. So after this happened, we can expect the company to maybe not change drastically, but it's certainly going to change uh, quite a bit in terms of the way it's managed and the, perhaps the strategies going forward. And so you end up in a position where four of the key managers now own 25% each. Uh, just a note on that sort of management by each manager having 25% each, that's a fairly good position because no single person uh, has too much power and yet it's not such a small amount of power that they're not going to be uh, interested or in, uh, massively involved even though they're already involved as managers they're involved as shareholders 25% is a uh, fairly sizable investment in the company and so that's quite a nice arrangement to have so in the first 10 years after the management buyout the business invested in new furnaces so that's more uh, investment in um, property plant and equipment in expanding the company and making their productive output higher so they can they can produce more uh, glassware they also invested in a new finishing line using a combination of debt finance and cash generated in the business okay so this is how they finance this they've, they've invested they want the company to grow this is perhaps the new direction they were going in whereas we had Joseph before we mentioned there was a slightly conservative approach these new managers are, are willing to put in the initial the upfront investment and hoping that investment turns into greater sales greater revenues further down the line okay so the fact that they used debt finance and cash that's the normal order you would expect uh, companies to to go about raising finance uh, if you've got cash uh, sitting around or ca extra cash then you use that to invest in the company uh, debt finance means either getting loans from the bank or potentially uh, selling bonds or something like that on the stock market probably more likely uh, but um, loans from the bank at this stage for a fairly small company um, but the main thing here is that you notice the equity finance hasn't been used they're taking the sort of normal traditional routes of cash then debt then equity uh, but it also suggests that perhaps they're reluctant to go ahead and uh, to um, you know float the float the company on the stock market. 
And that makes sense, obviously, uh, becoming a publicly traded company is a significant change for any business. And so keeping the company private, it gives the managers who each own 25% each more control over the direction of the business. That makes sense for the, the company as they are. So despite losing Joseph, the main man for the, the, the early years of the company, the business ranked, retained its reputation for high quality and crafted products that could be sold at premium prices. So here we're just sort of further establishing the fact that the company, um, after, after, after the sort of significant change after the management buyout, it still managed to keep its reputation for high quality and crafted products. That was obviously something the, the management uh, identified as very important to the company. They kept that uh, rather than changing significantly, and that was obviously a good thing. And we've also kind of got mention of premium prices, and that sort of relates back to our E1 uh, pricing strategy. So in this case, obviously, the company are using a premium pricing strategy. So today, King Crystal has a worldwide reputation. So they are sort of internationally known, not just well known in their own country. So we can expect uh, global sales here and obviously worldwide reach, which is good for producing clear crystal of the highest quality. Obviously, when you're almost a niche producer like this, the wider the, the, the pool of people that you can sell to, the better off you are. And this sort of feeds back into the marketing approach as well, having made sort of promoting this high quality where the best manufacturer of, of glassware that can go into their, their marketing and they make sure that they're, that's their main focus when, um, when talking about their product and trying to, trying to generate sales. King Crystal products are popular as gift items to mark important occasions such as weddings and milestone birthday. So again, as we've just mentioned, they're sort of certainly a, a small niche um, kind of product. And perhaps one might even say slightly old fashioned, these kind of traditional gifts given at certain times that we know that that has been tradition for a long time, but there may be questions over how popular that will be going forward, whether whether future generations will continue to give sort of uh, fancy glassware as gifts. And so that could spell real trouble for a company like this that obviously depends on their gifts being bought at uh, their products being bought as gifts. But on the positive side, we know they have this worldwide reputation. They can certainly push that. And uh, one of the main things they want to be doing then, this company, they seem to have already established their place uh, in the market globally. So the main sort of strategy for them going forwards, if we're thinking big picture, isn't going to be to expand or go into new markets or anything like that. It's really going to be to try and maintain their position by by keeping their market and by keeping the products high quality and keeping those uh, sales coming in. Okay, so as we go on, we get some more information. So currently the business has revenues in the region of 15 million G dollars per year and employs 110 people. So 15 million G dollars, we can assume this is roughly uh, equivalent rate to uh, Great British pounds or euros or uh, US dollars, something like that. And so 15 million a year for a company of that size is pretty good going. And 110 employees makes them a sort of small to medium sized company. Okay, so we learn a bit more about what's happened more recently. So only one of the original MBO team uh, Paulo Aldo, who is actually the current managing director of the company, still works in the business. So of the four that purchased the business back in 2000, only one remains. Uh, the other three have retired in the last five years. So this is fairly recent development in the company. Paulo, the managing director, now owns 55% of the company, with the remaining 45% still in the hands of the retired MBO managers, which means they have, uh, presumably, if it's an equal sharing between the three of them, they'll have 15% shares uh, each. Okay, so that means that the managing director is also the majority shareholder. That's nothing uh, too untoward for a private company like this as a fairly common situation. In fact, oftentimes the managing director will own 100% uh, of the company. So that's actually um, a fairly normal scenario. 
Uh, there's no real concerns there in terms of, of governance or anything like that. But something related to governance, which we might ask is, uh, what role do the uh, retired M uh, managers play? Obviously, they still own 15% each. They're the only other shareholders in the company. So they're obviously going to be very important to the company. And so you could imagine them having a kind of uh, advisory role in the running of the company, perhaps uh, almost like um, uh, non-executive directors. Okay, so in this final paragraph in the introduction, then we find out a bit about the kind of social and ethical um, sort of principles and ideals that the company has. So King Crystal, uh, they pride themselves as a fair employer and they pay above the national minimum wage to their unskilled employees. They provide a comprehensive apprenticeship scheme for glassblowers with competitive rates. They pride themselves as a champion of its local community with sponsorship of a number of community arts and crafts groups, as well as, well as a program of planting trees locally. So all of this stuff is kind of uh, sort of a summary of their uh, corporate social responsibility approach and the things that they're doing to make sure that they are, you know, um, meeting all the criteria for, with regards to that. Okay, so the, the sort of concerns here might be around the cost of paying above the national minimum wage, uh, whether that, that is something that attracts better workers, uh, whether it is not successful, we, uh, we don't know, but obviously that additional cost uh, on top of the high cost of the sort of master glass blower is going to mean that their labor cost um, in production is going to be very, very high. But obviously as a premium priced company uh, that they can still have quite a reasonable margin on that, um, uh, assuming that they maintain that quality and market their products appropriately. Also getting the local community on your side and being involved in that and pro planning trees, that's all good uh, with regards to stakeholder uh, management and keeping the local community happy, keeping your employees happy. Um, and particularly if we consider that we mentioned earlier on that the potentially high energy use and perhaps even pollution or, or wastage or something like that uh, of the company, they are at least trying to uh, counterbalance that with this sort of positive approach to the community and the environment. Okay, so finally we have this box at the bottom giving us a bit of information about your role. Now this is pretty much exactly the same as it is in every single exam sitting, in every single pre-scene that I've seen, uh, the role that your role in the exam never really changes much from this. So you are a finance officer in the finance department of King Crystal, so you're in the accounting department, you're fairly low down. Uh, it's not clear, you don't know how long you've been at the company for, but generally you're at the lowest rung of the finance department. You're principally responsible for preparing management accounting information, so that is your main priority, your main role. Although given the size of the business, you are often asked to perform tasks in other areas of the business. So if I were to summarize this in, in one sort of, sort of sentence, it would be, you could be asked to do almost anything. Okay, and what I mean by that is not literally anything, but within the operational syllabus, so that would be E1, P1 and F1, pretty much any of the major syllabus areas in those um, in those papers can come up in this exam. Now obviously uh, you're not going to be asked to perform any calculations or anything like that but you could be asked to um, comment on certain figures or ratios or, or management information that has been already prepared. So um, this is really just saying yes you're mainly preparing management accounting information but it doesn't mean you won't be asked about perhaps marketing or about uh, something in financial reporting or consolidations, whatever it might be. Okay, so moving on to the next page then, we get this article from the Gigland Manufacturers Monthly, so presumably this is some kind of uh, magazine or whatever it is given out to the main manufacturers in Gigland. And it's an insight to the crystal industry. So this is a way that SEMA is giving us an insight to how uh, crystal, uh, the crystal industry works, in, in particular in Gigland. So the first thing here 
If we just start with the first paragraph, Crystal is using Gearland to manufacture a range of household products. So that's the main kind of uh, market that uh, King Crystal are in, including drinking glasses, jugs, vases, and bowls. And that those are all the things that we know that King Crystal make. So let's just make a note of that. But notice that there are extra things included here. So plates, candle holders, and ornaments, and perhaps other things as well might be included. Uh, but the, none of these things are things which uh, King Crystal actually makes. So potentially there are a few new products that King Crystal could go into the manufacturer of there. Okay, so often a question you'll get in the real exam when you come to sit your exam in February, uh, the often a scenario is that the company is proposing a new lot line of products. They've calculated some figures and you are asked to sort of do a very uh, sort of operational level analysis of those figures and sometimes even give a, um, a recommended uh, sort of steps, uh, next steps. Okay, so the next paragraph, what makes a drinking glass a crystal product rather than glass? And here we find some, uh, for those of you who don't already know, I certainly didn't know this, the short answer is lead. So lead is what goes into uh, crystal, uh, into glass to make it crystal. That's what makes it uh, the better, higher quality product. And we have some information here regarding the uh, legal classifications of crystal. So make a note there for where if we're doing a pestle analysis remember that pestle the four the six uh, elements there uh, let's just write them down to refresh your memory so pestle is a tool you can use to analyze external environment in which a company is operating and each of the letters stand for a different aspect of that environment so p for political e for economical uh, s for social t for technological the second E is for environmental and L is for legal. So in this case, we have a legal classification of crystal. So presumably you cannot market your product as crystal where as if it does not meet these minimum criteria. Okay, so that's a legal classification related to the, the pastel analysis. And what we find is that to be classified as crystal, it needs to contain at least 18% of a lead based component such as lead oxide. A lead-based component content of over 24% means it's grade A, and below that is grade B. If a drinking glass contains less than 18% lead, then it is classified as glass rather than crystal. So let's just summarize uh, these different levels uh, of, of glassware here. Okay, so 24% or more is grade A. 18 to 24% is grade B and 18% or anything less than 18% is not considered crystal at all. That is just considered to be glass. Okay, so how about that then? So lead is used in the manufacture of crystal. That's an area that we need to unpack a little bit because obviously lead is, for one thing, lead is a commodity. And the key question to ask there as it's a commodity, is the price of it stable? What are the costs for the company? Is lead something that um, is easy to get? Is it the, the price change uh, volatiles, so like something like oil? Obviously, the price changes in oil changing all the time. Is lead more stable than that? And on the other, uh, also, whether you have well, the relationships with your reply, suppliers or what kind of suppliers you have are also going to impact the, your cost with regard to that. Okay, taking this from a different angle, there was also a concern over whether lead is poisonous. Now, in the last 20, 30 years, lead was an active component in lots and lots of uh, different uh, elements of manufacturing, and it's slowly been re removed uh, from things like petrol and paint, for example, uh, because of concerns over its, its being quite a poisonous element. Okay, so the main issues with that is for one, do people know that lead is what makes crystal? I didn't know that. I'm not sure if you knew that. Perhaps it is more common knowledge. It's something that I didn't know. But the the real issue is, do people mind that that's the case? Now, if you look this up, I look this up online, you find that the, the small amount of lead that actually goes into crystal is considered to be safe. 
uh, for drinking out of but the main concern is that you cannot use crystal uh, crystal ware to store anything in for a long period of time because the lead in the crystal mix actually seeps into the liquid potentially making it dangerous so lead should not be used for storage okay so with that in mind if anything comes up in the exam that suggests uh, you know this probably wouldn't happen because it would be an incredibly uh, naive thing to suggest for a crystal manufacturing company but anything any kind of product that is suggested that would uh, would mean that the crystal comes into contact with the the fluid or the food for a long period of time that should uh, immediately not be uh, considered and one more final thing to consider here is even though that it's generally considered to be safe to use lead uh, in the production of crystal and to use crystal for drinking at uh, some, uh, some point in the future th there may be some scientific study done or we find that lead actually shouldn't be used in anything at all that might be a political issue bringing it back to a pestle it might be that some governments decide that uh, even though it's, it's safe for the moment some governments might say okay we don't want any lead products any lead used in manufacturing and that's going to completely destroy a company like this so uh, do King Crystal have a backup plan for if uh, lead which is obviously a, 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 there's an issue around the use of lead do they have a backup plan for if they can no longer use lead or only have only allowed to use very small percent of lead because obviously uh, this company making this sort of high quality premium crystal wear they're going to be using a high percentage of lead to get that quality in that is obviously make it means more lead per unit of the glassware so a lower percentage probably going to be safer and if the government introduce introduce any legislation with a maximum amount of lead content what are King Crystal going to do about that okay and that kind of thinking is gonna link into the risk analysis uh, which is an important part of the P1 syllabus okay so now we've raised all these concerns about lead we're gonna go and look at why to include lead and the main reasons given here are for the most part for me they seem to be quite uh, to do with aesthetics and the feel of the glass and it's very much a part of what it looks like and feels like to give this pre prestige and, and luxury finish but it's not actually essential and necessary so let's take a look here so the inclusion of lead adds weight to a crystal product giving it a ringing quality and allows for a high level of light refraction meaning a product that sparkles with brilliance so all of these things uh, go towards making a, a nicer or aesthetically pleasing uh, it feels nicer in your hands with the weight it feels sturdier these are all things that are nice but completely non-essential to uh, glassware okay and in the production process as well it makes the mix easier to work with for glass blowers so it does make the work slightly easier uh, as when cooling the mix is stronger and more pliable than without lead so far no other metal oxides have come close to creating the same crystal qualities so there is no no obvious substitute for lead in the manufacturing of crystal okay but notice that it says so far no other metal oxide have come close so there's no substitute at the moment but who's to say what could happen down the line some new technology comes around and a way of making crystal can be done without having to use lead obviously that's going to be preferable because you're completely removing uh, the use of what is technically a poisonous uh, a poisonous element okay so what could king crimson uh, king crimson sorry uh, king crystal do to take advantage of this the fact that you know future tech may find a better way of making crystal well they could invest in research and development or something like that we don't know whether that's appropriate for them but that again that's just something to kind of bear in mind going through this that obviously company is very dependent on lead lead doesn't seem to be an ideal substance um, perhaps okay in the short term but in the long term we can see potential issues with the use of lead so what can the company do, company do to protect themselves against that possible risk okay so moving on in the next paragraph we learn a bit more about the industry in gigland regarding crystal so the we learn there are only four businesses in gigland with revenues greater than a million g dollars that manufacture household products in crystal one of these is potter's crystal 
and they are the largest measured by revenue with King Crystal, that's your company, next. Okay, so the main, the biggest manufacturer of household crystal products is actually Potter's Crystal. They're the largest by revenue and King Crystal, we are in second place. So our main competitor then has been identified and that's going to be Potter's Crystal. Okay, so something that has come up in exams in the past is a kind of competitor analysis where you're given certain information, perhaps you're given um, some of the extracts of the financial statements and some ratio analysis is done or you're looking at the production methods or some kind of thing where you're looking at a key competitor in this case it could be Potter's Crystal and your job will be to look at what they're doing and identify things that they're doing better than we are and what can we do to uh, to better compete with them so that's a common exam question that's come up in the past and could easily come up again in February Okay, so all of the main four manufacturers use the centuries-old tradition of hand-blowing the crystal using highly skilled craftspeople. Only one makes coloured crystal. Okay, so there we've been introduced to a new concept, something else that King Crystal doesn't do. It doesn't deal with coloured crystal. All of the others, in fact, only one of the four do coloured crystal, so it's a specialty, a niche for that particular company. And so if uh, we're thinking if King Crystal are thinking of going into coloured crystal, which they're not necessarily doing, we would need to consider the fact that this company at the moment are are the 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 main the main company that are doing coloured crystal, so it's going to be uh, difficult to compete with them as someone that doesn't already deal with uh, coloured crystal. And the main reason uh, most of the companies don't deal with colored crystal are the difficulties of combining the minerals needed to produce the color in the crystal mix. So it's a difficult production process. Obviously, this one company have decided to keep doing it. That's worked out for them because now they seem to be the sole manufacturer of colored crystal in the, in the country, which puts them in a privileged position. And all the other companies, since they've stopped doing it, they're going to struggle to try and re-enter that market. Okay, so King Crystal, we're in second place in terms of revenue, so that's pretty good out of the four, we're in the top two at least. So in the final paragraph, uh, we learn a bit about the uh, crystal market. So to put it into context, these four businesses account for 10% of Gigland's manufacturing capacity for household glass and crystal. So the manufacture of crystal is a very small percent of the overall market, just 10%. Another 89% or basically 90% is from 15 manufacturers of standard glass and household products. So by far the most, the biggest part of the market is just standard glassware. Ranging from fine glass uh, to thick cookware, toughened glass. The remaining 1% is from small artisan glassware manufacturers. Okay, so that's given us a better idea of the state of the market. We know that 10% of the market is crystal manufacturing and of that 10% there are only four businesses uh, with greater than 1 million in revenue so there are probably more overall there are probably many more smaller companies working in it but uh, only four of big companies and King Crystal is just one of those four so if we sort of predict that of that 10% King Crystal perhaps has in second place maybe three to four percent of the overall uh, market share, then that's uh, that gives us an idea of the entire glassware market. King's Crystal is only maybe taking up, this is an estimate, um, maybe three or four percent of that. Okay, so in terms of uh, their their place within purely the crystal uh, industry, they're, they're doing well, they're in second place, but in the overall glassware um, industry in the country they are a very small uh, part of the market and certainly puts them in this kind of niche area of the market thank you very much for watching and I hope you to see you in the next one okay so now we're going to move on to the final page uh, that we'll be looking at in this video and here we learn about the different products that King Crystal have to offer. 
Okay, so the first paragraph is more of the same, really. All of our products are made from the finest grade A lead crystals. That means they're using 24% lead. If you're purchasing a King Crystal product, you can be sure that you are receiving a crystal of the highest quality from our selection of raw material suppliers, our highly skilled glass blowers, and keen attention to detail when finishing every item. Quality is our primary concern. So we've, we've already established that quality is going to be a key um, critical success factor for this company very important to them but perhaps what we're getting here is a taste of their marketing approach so this is they're certainly um, pushing that element of their product and this is going to be a key area not only of their success but probably the main thing that they're pushing in their marketing is the quality of their product okay so they know what they are good at and they're pushing that thing but a question to consider here just as a normal person um, how important is it to you that your glassware is really really high quality when you're say going out perhaps just uh, you've moved into a new place for the first time you're moving away from home or whatever it is and you're going out to buy uh, cutlery and crockery and glassware for yourself are you really going to go out and start paying premium prices for really top end glassware or are you just going to do something that does the job for cheaper because really at the end of the day we're talking about drinking some water or a glass of coke or a beer or whatever it is um, a glass of wine is it really necessary uh, just 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 something to keep in mind how important to you is it that you have the highest quality glassware okay that's going to be important to determining who exactly are the key uh, demographic for this kind of product all right so we can go through this bit fairly quickly because all we're really given here is a list of the different products that are available from King Crystal so we know they make drinking glasses and they make three different types of drinking glass they make stem glasses for wine they make flutes for champagne and sparkling wine and they make tumblers which are the small glasses for spirits soft drinks water and increasingly these days wine so perhaps uh, built into that is the suggestion that people aren't buying wine glasses as much as they once did okay so which of these different types of glass are made in different sizes so the wine glasses or the stem glasses and tumblers are made in three sizes small medium and large flutes are made in just two sizes large and medium in addition to that they offer six different ranges of drinking glasses so each with its own distinctive style and full complement of glass types so in total that's 48 different glasses to choose from that seems like an awful lot of different glasses to me uh, especially for this smaller company they make every product by hand that's a wide array of different things now this is probably something that plays in to the nature of the company as they are a small company and they make things by hand then it's easier for them to make lots of different things because human beings are involved in the manufacturing they haven't got to set up production lines and machines with all these different settings to make 48 different kinds of glasses you just say to the glass blower oh we need this many of this type of glass and they can go ahead and do that they can switch uh, their they can switch their skills to make different kinds of product because that's one of the main benefits of having uh, highly skilled labor uh, within your production okay so from six ranges is quite a lot of different ranges of glassware I wonder how of those six which ones are the most popular which ones sell the best which ones sell the worst whether six is really necessary maybe four or three could reduce the amount of uh, molds and things like that that the company needs to keep in order to produce the ranges of glassware then again at the same time variety could be one of their main uh, main things that's making them popular so too early to tell at this stage but something to keep in mind moving on to the jugs then so they make jugs in three different sizes small medium and large to match each of our distinctive glass drinking races so there's three different sizes of jug each in the six different ranges so that makes 18 different types of jug that can be made okay and here's some more of their kind of marketing talk so each jug is individually blown with the spouts and the handle skillfully crafted by our most experienced glass blowers okay so actually that's that's useful information so the jugs are perhaps something that only the most experienced glass blowers 
can make the apprentices and the 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 less experienced glass blowers perhaps aren't able to make the more complicated products that's obviously going to put a constraint on their ability to produce certain numbers of products moving on to bowls so the company make 20 different handcrafted crystal bowls um, and vases they make 22 different vases ranging in size from small neck single bloom vases to large display vases etc okay so in total if we total all these up that comes to 108 different product lines now that is certainly quite a lot we already said that 48 was quite a lot and that might suit the kind of artisan mastery of glass blowing where it's it's easier for a human to make a variety of different products than it is for a machine however that being said all of these different things are going to require certain equipment and molds are going to be needed for all the different um, all the different kinds of products you can get there's different levels of expertise so with jugs we know that the most experienced glass blowers make the jugs uh, perhaps that and we've noted that that's a constraint so this is an awful lot of different things that the company is producing and surely if we were to do some kind of analysis we would find that certain products are not selling well at all perhaps just a few a year whereas other ones the most popular ones are selling hundreds or thousands per year so I could foresee a question where we're sort of analyzing the performance of different lines trying to figure out uh, which ones are the most profitable which ones we should really push and which ones we should be limiting the production of and perhaps even discontinuing completely all right so that brings us to the end of video one we've just looked through, through the first three pages there and we've already start to get a really good idea of where the company is their place within the overall market in their country and the different products that they have to offer so what we're going to do with that information it's not the full information it's limited but what we can do is put together a sort of early draft of a SWOT analysis so for those of you who don't remember a SWOT analysis is a tool for examining the strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats of a company that's what it stands for SWOT and the idea is you look at strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats and you figure out ways of uh, making the most of your strengths, taking advantage of opportunities, trying to minimize, reduce weaknesses and avoid threats. And the idea is strengths and weaknesses are internal to the company. Opportunities and threats are external. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is just to pause the video for a few minutes and jot down some ideas for a SWOT analysis for the company based on just based on the information we've looked at in these first few pages. So pause the video, jot down some ideas. When you come back, I will go through the same thing on the screen. I'll put forward some of my ideas for what I've had for a SWOT analysis. Okay, so welcome back. I hope you got down some good ideas. I'm just going to go through what I have now. Okay, so for strengths then, we, we could identify quite a few strengths for the company. Uh, these are the ones I have. So first up, I have the company's uh, reputation. Okay, so they're internationally recognized as a producer of high quality products and that's going to be good for them in terms of their marketing and that's, that's an important aspect of any business in order to succeed. They have a good global reputation. Uh, and related to that as well is the fact that their reputation is for high quality, so they're known to be a producer of high quality products. Another strength I've put down is the staff. So they've got this this this, uh, this labor force of highly skilled glass blowers. They have probably some, maybe some of the best glass blowers in the country. That's going to put them in, at a competitive advantage in terms of how, being able to make the best quality product and to compete with the other major players in in the industry. Okay, and the final strength I put down was the ethical sort of corporate social responsibility. We learned on the first page that the company was uh, above minimum wage employer. They offer competitive salaries to their glass blowers. They're involved in community activities and they're involved in tree planting. So they, they do seem to have things go, go, going well uh, in that particular area and that is certainly a strength for them. Uh, moving on to weaknesses then. 
Okay, so one concern I have is the number of product lines they have. 108 different product lines for a fairly smallish company it means that some of them are probably not worth even having. So um, weakness is perhaps they're spreading themselves too thin on the variety that they offer. Perhaps they should just concentrate on a small number of of guaranteed profitable products that they can produce easily and well. Uh, another weakness was uh, they have a fairly small market share. Okay, so we figured out that as only 10% of the overall glassware industry was crystal and there are four main players within that, um, crystal just being one of them, then they are in second place so they perhaps have a higher share than the lower two but we're looking at a fairly small percentage, maybe three, four, maybe up to 5% of the total market share. That's quite small, uh, that makes them niche. Okay, opportunities, not a great deal we've learned with regards to opportunities. We haven't really looked enough at the wider industry for that, but one thing I considered was the possibility of finding a replacement for lead. I know it said in the pre-scene that nothing has been found that compares to lead, but that's not to say that something in the future isn't possible so perhaps new technologies may develop in the future where something can replace lead uh, reducing the issues that we highlighted regarding the use of lead okay another opportunity i noted and i know that this sort of goes into contrast to the idea of reducing their product line but the idea here is that there are a number of products that we highlighted that are part of the industry such as as plates and candle holders that the company currently doesn't make and they may be better off doing a variety of different completely different kinds of things so glasses and bowls and plates and candlesticks etc but in a fewer number of ranges than they are just doing four things in this huge different uh, wide variety of ranges so the idea there is that's the idea there behind new products and finally the threats so we identified a number of large competitors of a similar sort of size to uh, King Crystal. So there is already a company that uh, uh, may take up a bigger market share in terms of revenue. Uh, King Crystal in second place. There's two other companies below. We're not sure how far behind they are, but they both make more than a million uh, G dollars per year. That's just within Crystalware. If we go into the sort of 90% of the market that is just glassware, uh, there's probably huge companies uh, in, in that part of the market that are making glassware and that it may be possible for them to potentially go into making crystalware or this sort of high quality glass that isn't quite crystal but makes as a good substitute. There's a serious threat there um, for any company in the crystal manufacturing market. Uh, it certainly includes King Crystal. And one final threat I put down is the use of lead. Now this isn't necessarily specific to this company. Any any company that produces crystal are using lead, but for that industry, there is potentially a threat that lead uh, over time may become more and more difficult to use in a sort of commercial everyday household products due to concerns over its uh, being poisonous and its toxicity. Okay, so there's my SWOT analysis. Hopefully you had some of those and maybe you had some things that I haven't considered. That's great. Uh, thank you for watching the video. I hope you've enjoyed this and got something out of this. And I hope you continue to watch the rest of the videos uh, in the series. All that remains for me to say is thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. And I'll just take a few moments of your time if I could to just tell you about some of the other case, st case study materials that we offer. So one of the things is a study text. Now this is a study text specifically aimed at the case study and we have one for each level. So we have an operational management and strategic level one and they're designed to help you pass the study. They're in two halves. The first half is exam tips and this exam strategy and advice on how to answer questions and all the really useful kind of tips that you need going into these exams and how to prepare for them. And then the second half, the second part of those is a recap of the key theory that always comes up in the case studies again and again. So those are really useful, really valuable thing that you can get. Uh, those are available online and you can get the, an actual textbook, a print physical textbook for the old fashioned among you who like to do it that way still. Uh, we also have course videos that correspond 
uh, with that study text as well. So we have a series of really nicely well produced, well done videos uh, in which we basically take you through exactly what's involved in the case study and how you can uh, spend your time preparing for it to ensure that you get really good marks. It's really, really great um, series of videos there. We've got the pre-scene analysis, which the video you just watched is an example of the pre-scene analysis. And there'll be several more videos just like that, where we look at every, every tiny detail of the pre-scene and we relate it back to the, the P1 or F1 or E1 and we relate it to real life scenarios, relate it to uh, actual business and analysis tools. And we give you the um, what we expect to be the top 10 issues. Another thing that we do is slightly different is the industry analysis. And that is a really, this is a really great document in which we basically cover everything um, that's relevant to the industry for the particular business that we're looking at. And it goes from the history through to the, the customers and suppliers and the market and how the market has functioned and the history of that. And we've got statistics in there and diagrams and it's full of information. It's so, so useful. And at the end of that pack, we also have 25 actual industry examples. So real life things that have happened in that industry that um, kind of examples of things that might actually happen to this, uh, to the company in the exam. So it gives you a sense of the kind of things that are going on in the industry and how real life businesses in that industry have coped with it. We have mock exams, which are, if you were going to pick any one of these to do, I would suggest it was the mock exams because nothing prepares you for the exam more than actually sitting a mock exam. And if I were, if I were a student taking this, I would certainly put mock exams at the top of my list along with marking and feedback. Now our mock exams are actually um, designed to match the way that the actual SEMA exams are. So you can sit them on your laptop and they'll be timed and automatic and they are as close as you are going to get to the real thing. And you can get marking and feedback on that as well, which is probably the most invalu uh, valuable thing you could probably get to get specific feedback from, uh, from a marker who deals with this exam four times a year that's the best way for you to improve your uh, your ability to pass this exam as quickly as possible. We also have a masterclass. So as an online company, we hold an online masterclass, which you can sign up for. And it's a, um, a day over, over the weekend. We do the Saturday and a Sunday. And it's, it's a full day's worth of a, we have an expert who, who takes an online seminar and we go through everything um, specific to that case study that you can do to get prepared for the exam and we cover all sorts and it's very very popular among students who like a one-on-one -on -one kind of classroom environment um, in an online in an online situation we also offer pass guarantee so if you do uh, if you're unlucky enough to not uh, pass your exam the first time round, then there's no worries because we give you the option if you if you choose a pass guarantee option, then as long as you hit all the basic all the all the minimum requirements that we ask, and you don't pass, then you get uh, you get access to our materials for the next sitting uh, completely free of charge. So there's there's something that we're doing to try and to try and get you. Um, hopefully, if you if you signed up to our course and you do everything that we say you should do, then you probably will pass first time. That tends to be the way it goes. But if you should be unfortunate, if it's a particularly tough exam, then we'll let you have another go um, for free. So that's it. Thanks again for watching. Remember, my name is James. You can find me on Facebook, James Nutting Astranti, where I'll be posting all sorts of information about the upcoming exam in February. Make sure you check that out. Um, because there's always something to talk about with regards to that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.